Good afternoon, good evening, and good morning. Uh, wherever you're joining us from, welcome. Uh, my name is Junlei Li. I'm the Sao Zen Senior Lecturer in Early Childhood Education here at uh, Harvard Graduate School of Education. Uh, welcome to today's Education Now episode. This is a webinar series designed to respond uh, to the dramatic changes and to identify transformative opportunities in the field of education um, during and after the COVID-19 pandemic. In today's conversation, we'll discuss an emerging concept called early relational health. And then we want to look at how all of us as educators, parents, and community stakeholders can improve the health and the well-being and development uh, for young children and their families. Today's episode mm -hmm. is being recorded and will be available to view on the Harvard Education YouTube channel and Facebook page. And you can also visit our website for recordings and information about future episodes. Uh, please feel free to submit your questions using the Q&A button at the end uh, of your Zoom screen. And you can also find closed caption access there. Let me welcome our two guests. Um, both of them are pediatricians who have made promoting early relational health uh, the centerpiece of their work, whether in clinical practice or in building programs and systems and policies. Uh, we have Dr. Usha Ramachandran. Um, she is a practicing pediatrician. Yesterday when we were prepping for our conversations, she still was masked and uh, she had just finished seeing her patients um, in the office. She's an associate professor of pediatrics at Rutgers, uh, Robert Wood Johnson Medical School. And she's also an early childhood champion for the New Jersey chapter of the American Academy of Pediatrics. She serves as the medical director of the Reach Out and Read program in New Jersey. Uh, it's an initiative that uses the medical infrastructure to encourage supportive educational conversations with parents about early relationships. We also have Dr. David Willis, senior fellow from the Center for the Study of Social Policy. Among his many leadership roles in early childhood, he had served as the division director for home visiting and early childhood systems at the Federal Health Resources and Services Administration, overseeing the implementation of the Maternal Infant and Early Childhood Home Visiting Program. He was also the first chair of the American Academy of Pediatric Board's Early, Early Brain and Child Development Initiative. And prior to that, Dr. Willis is a practicing pediatrician for over three decades. I'm so glad to see you both, Usha and David. Hi, Jenny. Hi, Usha. Hi, everyone. I'm thrilled to be here, and especially thrilled to be with, um, in the midst of educators. Well, Usha, if you don't mind, I would love to start with you. Um, I know that you regularly see children and families, uh, young children as well as adolescents, and you talk to parents. Over the last two years, um, young children, older children, families have all been undergoing a tremendous amount of stress. And I just wonder from your clinical practice, what have you seen um, in terms of the challenges and struggles that children and family have faced? Um, thank you, Jinlei. It, you know, you sort of really alluded to it, the stress, right? All of us have faced challenges over the past couple of years, but I feel like parents, especially parents of young children, um, have really faced a, a lot of challenges over the past several years, uh, you know, the past two years. Um, I've heard so much about, you know, financial hardship, um, you know, parents having to stop working because they have to, you know, they don't have safe childcare options for their children. Um, and, you know, lots and lots of stress, the stress of isolation, you know, parents worry about my kids missed out on so many of the normal childhood experiences. Um, you know, adolescents have stayed home for, you know, a year plus in many cases right, not out there with their peers. So parents have been really, really worried about all of that and just juggling so many things, juggling jobs and uh, home, you know, kids being home, being virtually schooled, 
um, and, and all of that. And we've, you know, these stresses, we've kind of known for a while now that chronic hardships like poverty, experiencing racism, um, you know, social isolation, we've known for a while that these can be major, major stressors. They can cause what's, what we call toxic stress that can lead to lots of, you know, bad consequences, both immediate and long-term. Um, but those, you know, those stresses, those chronic hardships and the effects of those conditions have really been multiplied and just been made like so much more obvious over this pandemic. You know, families uh, that were already having a hard time coping have just had to deal with a whole lot more over the past couple of years. So there's just a lot of stress that parents are seeing and facing and lots and lots of challenges. We're seeing results of that. We're seeing an uptick in mental health issues, adolescents with anxiety, depression, sleep problems. I mean, literally every day I'm seeing that. Um, younger kids with behavior problems. Um, you know, a lot of, lot of times with the younger children, the anxiety um, and depression even manifests as behavior problems, you know, they're acting out. And so we're seeing a lot of that, lots of sleep issues as well. And even some, you know, people say, well, you know, stress can cause mental, emotional issues, we get that, but we're also seeing medical consequences. There's been a huge uptick in obesity just in our, our health center. Um, you know, and there's, it's multifactorial. There's not one thing that caused this uptick in obesity, but the stress, the anxiety and eating because you're bored or because you're anxious, that could be causing that as well. So lots and lots of things. But I also have to mention that despite all of this, I am noticing some really uplifting things as well, which have sort of made me, you know, given me hope, so to speak. When I ask parents about how are they coping, I'm hearing these great, great stories. And so often the coping has to do with relationships. You know, there's a parent who oh. talked about how um, now that everyone has learned how to use Zoom and other, you know, virtual, you know, connection, you know, connections, grand, their grandparent is now over the weekend teaching their son how to make their family's traditional dishes. Um, you know, so that family is kind of, you know, doing that to sort of cope with, with the pandemic and so on. The other thing that I've been super, that has sort of blown me away, when all this started, when we, after the, the, the short period of time when we weren't seeing patients in person, when we started seeing patients for well child visits, I was convinced, here I was in a mask and this face shield. I was convinced the little babies are going to be scared of me, that I'm not going to be able to connect with them. And I was blown away by the fact that when I walked in like that, and then I it did my usual, you know, the, the way we talk to babies, right? Um, and I was smiling underneath my mask, they would respond. They would smile back. They would poo back. They would interact with me just as if I didn't have all these things on. That kind of blew me away. The fact that, you know, Connection can happen despite barriers, all of these barriers. It sort of really brought it home to me in a very visceral kind of way. Thank you, Usha, for painting such a vivid picture of both risk and resilience, just from the perspective kind of of your pediatric office, seeing children and families. And um, we have collectively you know, known a long time the connection between stress a mitigated stress and health outcomes. I think what is new here, as we talk about this early relational health is to add in this part that Usha you were talking about, about relationships, how that relationship is this kind of middle mediator, right? Between the kind of stress that we experience on the outside and the health and developmental outcomes coming out the back end of it. So David, I'd love to turn to you because you have been championing the inter of relationships and health long before the pandemic even began. I'm sure you'll be doing it long after the pandemic is over. Oh. Kind of what do you see as both the challenge and opportunity at this point in thinking about relationship and health together when it comes to young children and families? All right. Thank you for inviting me and hello to the audience. Welcome for the conversation. And Usha, you remind me of my clinical days um, 
in terms of just the experience of being with families every day and feeling with them the challenges that they have, but also feeling their hope and witnessing their, the, the, the incredible resiliency that families and communities can bring. My work now is about um, um, really moving this relational frame. What is so striking is the power of relationships to both build well-being in, at every level, but also to heal from stress and challenge. And the opportunity in front of us, given the COVID moment, is remembering that connecting, being together, having um, moments of true exchange of experience, that eye contact, the telling the stories, the being, listening and being present with one another is really what first makes us all human. Two, allows us to bear hard times and challenges. And three, is where hope lies for getting through really hard and challenging moments. You know, that's not actually a new discovery. It's known forever in human history, certainly known by all of us personally, often with our families, but it has been something that we for, we've sometimes forgotten in the way our culture has evolved over these last decades, where the focus on being a solid, separate individual has sometimes been more important than remembering that we all need to be connected and relational. So as I look at COVID and the, the, the challenges of COVID, I've been, as Usha, heartened, well, or first um, um, struck by how hard it's been for so many of us because it's been such a change, not the least of which has been the trauma of losing loved ones and the disruption of so many parts of our daily lives has been really hard on people. But I've also been struck with how people have come together and how um, in neighborhoods and in communities and in churches and in families, um, we hear of the stories of families coming together, of neighbors helping neighbors, of communities taking care of one another, of outreach that's deeply relational and meaningful. And that's I think a growing movement of recognition that all of our well being, our mental, physical, emotional, educational well being, is by the solidness of our connections with others at every level, not just peer to peer, but also generationally. At every level, those connections really matter. And it's, again, not a discovery, but a new emphasis. So all of our work at the Center for Study of Social Policy about early relational health is remembering that those foundational relationships matter. And even for our teens and for our adults and for every one of us, our relationships matter and help shape our ability to bear hard times. None of us are islands and that's a myth. And when all of us need those kinds of moment to moment connections that matter um, in terms of not only the simple interactions of little moments every day, but that intentionality of how are you listening deeply to the people that we care about that are around us and near us. So um, that's the space I, uh, that I'm finding so um, heartening, but also accelerating about the power and the importance and the value that's more deeply relationally focused and community focused. Yep. David and Usha, you both mentioned the word hope and you tied hope, whether at a family scale or a community scale to the intentional relationship building or the, the, the intentional reconnecting of relationships, even after it has been disrupted. Um, I'm curious, um, Usha, let me start with you again. Within the context of your work as a practicing pediatrician, so the traditional view is, you know, a pediatrician or any doctor is there to treat illnesses. Like, what does it mean within your work as a pediatrician to offer what I might call kind of hopeful encouragements to families about, about the power of the relationship they have with their children? Um, how, how does that enter uh, into your pediatric practice? It's, 
such a great question. Um, so almost all, every pediatrician went into pediatrics because they want to make an impact on a child's life, right? At least, you know, in the beginning, that was our, that was the, the ideal that kind of drove us into pediatrics. The fact that we can be part of a child's journey, like life journey. Um, and so as we learn more and more about the power of relationships, I mean, we've already always known, like David just said, we've always known that relationships are important. Parent-child relationships are important. But I think we're learning more and more and more now how those relationships can buffer against, you know, toxic stress and adversity, um, create resilience, and can lead to long-term positive outcomes, right? So that is sort of the work that every pediatrician wants to do. They want to be able to have at least a small, a little tiny bit of impact on their patients' um, long-term you know, success and outcomes and so on and so forth. Um, and so I really think that, and you know, so it, it's something that is sort of starting to come to the forefront, especially in pediatric primary care. We're starting to recognize that we do a lot of good work in pediatric primary care, but if we do not sort of promote those relationships support families in establishing and maintaining and strengthening those relationships. Much of the work that we do is going to be incomplete. Kids, children develop in, a, you know, in the context of relationships. So that has to be front and center of what we do. So we sort of started to think more intentionally about that. You know, how do we do that at World Child Visits? How do we do it in a way in which we're, you know, we're intentional, but also we're not sort of, you know, prescribing things. Like we're not telling parents what to do. How are we starting to have those conversations with families? Um, so we're really starting to embark on that journey. Um, I've sort of really been in, in the process of that journey. It's, it's, it's sort of like a paradigm shift and putting relationships front and center, starting with really thinking about how do I work on my relationship with a parent? Because if that's not on a sound footing, I'm not going to be, nothing else that I do is going to really make an impact. So it's really been a journey that I've sort of, it's a personal journey. It's a journey that I'm trying to, it, it, it's, I think it's a journey that pediatric primary care is on. Um, medical education is just starting to recognize the value of this kind of promotional work and we're trying to do that in New Jersey, both in my medical school, other uh, residency programs in New Jersey and so on, really shine a light on how important this is um, and learn along the way from families, from communities, how do we do this right? How do we, yeah, how do we do this in a way that makes sense for families and, and helps families? What is, uh, Lucia, what, what is something that you find helpful uh, in building relationship with families and encouraging their relationship with children that you think might be possible, not just for pediatricians, but for anyone who has an opportunity that come, to come in to contact with families? So the, I can speak from my own personal experience. One of the things that I have really started to do over the pandemic, because parents were so anxious, especially about their parenting, you know, I have started to really recognize, observe, notice, um, you know, the great things that every parent is doing. There might be things that all of us, there's things we're not doing, but there's so many, many great things that we're all doing as parents. So I really made it a point to sort of observe, notice intentionally and speak to parents about that, give them that positive feedback and say, look at this. I see how when he was upset with the vaccines, you comforted him. That is such a great thing. He needs, he needs that from you. And I see this happening and this is so great. Um, so I've sort of really intentionally started to notice that. And it's been really like, you know, uh, parents have really like become teary-eyed when they hear that sometimes, you know, they're like, oh my gosh, I was beating myself up for putting it in front of the TV too long because I've been so frazzled lately. I'm so happy you said that. And it just changes the tenor of the rest of the visit. 
So that's one thing that I really started to do. And then just validating to parents that parenting is difficult. Parenting right now is even more difficult. So to sort of really validate that as well. Um, and, so, and, and just come from a place of not judging anything and not taking anything for granted. Can I, can I lean in to your question about hope? Because Please. as I was listening to Usha and I was reflecting on um, my own experiences, um, I, two thoughts came to mind. One is, you know, hope is given from someone else when you're struggling. It is a shared experience. And it makes me, you know, the, the, there's a frequent commented note that says hope springs eternal. And I think that that's both a shared experience, a cultural experience, maybe a religious experience, but the like it's in that relationships that hope is often given or discovered together. And I think that's really important in the relational space. Secondly, curiously, um, one of my colleagues, um, Bob Sagi, is leading um, the work at Tufts called the Hope Network, which is a play on words because it's health outcomes of positive experiences, but that is hope. And those relationships of positive experiences have health implications. They counter stress and adversity. They build well-being. And more importantly, which gets me all excited as a physician and a researcher is how that hope positive experience becomes into the body, how the physiology of our, of our um, whole body experience gets built into you know, the way our physiology works. Those positive experiences become embodied that not only are good for our health and our well-being, but they give us that emotional sense of hope, strength, and positive experiences. That's how this all gets connected. So when you mention hope, sometimes in the relationships we have with one another, that caring, that sensitivity when people are struggling is how we share that sense of hope and possibility that you can get through it because I believe in you. And I'm sure for those, the many people that are listening in, their experiences themselves with their own families or with their colleagues or with the children and the families that they experience, the hope that we all have together, we'll get through this in the resiliency of the human spirit in the developmental capacities of all children and families to find positive ways of future being. And the resiliency that's built into all of us is what I think about when I think about this moment in time relationally. All right, so as, as I'm listening to, to both of you, I just am struck by how both of you approach the sense of hope. And, and how the kind of things that you're talking about, acknowledging the challenges without judgment, building trust, but then building on trust, and then offer encouragement for the kind of relationship building that people already do, uh, in spite of the challenges around them. Like all these things, they're not just practices or principles that might guide pediatric work, but I can imagine that these are principles, David, you know, in your work overseeing home visiting um, or just any kind of work that supports other people, whether they're parents or teachers who are always in the process of building and reconnecting relationships. Um, I'm going to turn to a couple of the questions that have come in through the audience. Um, both of you have talked about um, paradigm shift in thinking about the connection between relationship and health. So one question is, you know, we should talk about kind of what this meant at the practice level. David, let me maybe start with you. What do you think this could mean at the policy making system building level? What difference does it make for us to see relationship as core to health and to learning and development? And, and what can policymakers do? Once one has, once you have the eye on the criticalness of relationships, ask yourself the policy questions that don't support relationships. And there are many. Ask yourself then too, the policy opportunities that are in front of us right now, paid family leave, child tax credit to counter poverty, 
and then the the Medicaid transfer the Medicaid policies that allow for uh, mental health supports and supports for mothers and babies at the same time. The building of, um, of, of models of support for relationships at every level of our systems. The policy implications of taking a relational frame are dramatic and emergent, yet require that, that all of us be mindful that focusing solely on the individual needs without focusing on the relational needs is a fool's errand. We have to be very cautious, very intentional about building um, networks of supports at every level of our communities and in our service sectors to address the relational healing and opportunities that are in front of us now. So at a policy level, it's a grand moment of um, emergent change that uh, many of us are working to see happen. Great. And um, Usha, I'm going to direct this uh, a question from the audience, which is that from your role as a pediatrician, as kind of the trusted vo vo voice for families, um, what advice would you have for parents or teachers or caregivers who are simultaneously dealing with their own stress and challenges while trying to interact and build a relationship with children? who are also dealing with their own drama and their own challenges? That's a great question. And it's all of us, we're all stressed. Um, and that's one thing that I sort of say to parents all the time, be easy on yourself. You know, uh, these are not, these are unprecedented things, right? And kids are resilient. Um, so, so don't beat yourself up, you know, do the best you can, take care of yourself and in whatever way, it makes sense to you, reach out for help. Um, we have started really, you know, make, making sure we make parents aware of resources within the community for just support groups, um, mental health services, and so on and so forth. So really sort of trying to emphasize to parents that they need to sort of take care of themselves in order to be able to take care of their kids, but also emphasizing that a, parent, a great parent-child relationship or like a fun, loving interaction between a parent and child doesn't just benefit the child. It benefits the parents as well. Um, in a similar way, as a pediatrician, I recognized over the pandemic, especially in the first few months when I was so stressed and, and you know, I would do telehealth visits. And when I connected with a family and a patient and saw that smile on the other end of the camera. And when they were inquiring about my safety and so on, I realized that my relationships with my patients also benefited me. It, it sort of calmed my anxiety, gave me a sense of purpose. So relationships and their benefits are bi-directional. So when I help parents to just, you know, set aside a little bit of time every day to read a book and interact with their kids, sing with them, play with them, it's not just for the kid, it's for the parents as well. But definitely really encourage and normalize seeking help and taking care of your mental health and really screening for mental health issues in, in parents as well. Thank you, Wisha. Um, there's one last question and uh, Usha and David, if you don't mind, I'm gonna try to answer it by channeling what I just heard from both of you. So the question is, as school leaders, what evidence can we share with teachers um, to inspire them to prioritize building relationships with young students as the foundation uh, for learning? And um, I think I'm just gonna broaden the question just a little bit. The question is, you know, how do we inspire and encourage teachers to build relationships. Evidence is just a part of it. And I'm thinking about Usha, what you just said earlier. I would think that school leaders can start with where you start with families, by acknowledging the challenges, by trusting their capacity, and by offering encouragement for the kind of relationships that they are already building. And David, channeling, I think what you described earlier, it's this idea that from the leadership role, we can start to prioritize relationships so that the reopening of the schools isn't just about how do we catch up and how behind children are and so on, but that we can lead with the question, how do we reconnect the relationship? And on that relational foundation, 
let's focus, then let's build on teaching and build on learning and build on family partnerships. So uh, let me just pause here to see if I've channeled both of your messages correctly here. Certainly from mine, that sense of the intentionality that hope springs eternal and that's in relationships. And then secondly, the intentionality of sharing the moments together for the moment of meaning, because that's where we all find space. And third, when I think about teachers, those moments they can have eye to eye contact with every one of the children that come in their office, in their, in their room, the, those brief moments have such power and such meaning for both. And I think that that's the opportunity in front of us too. I agree, Jinle, you, you said it perfectly. You sort of really put those relationships first and you know, front and center of all the work that we do. I do want to very quickly mention that so many parents have actually told me that watching their kids being educated virtually gave them so much insight into what teachers are doing and appreciation for all the stuff that they're doing. So I wanted to, to, to mention that as well. Educators have gone above and beyond to keep kids learning and keep the kids safe over the past two years. And parents are right. seeing that. That's right. And, and in relation to that question, I also thought of kind of the experimental evidence that really validates what both of you have said, that these intentional efforts to build relationships can make a significant, almost outsized impact. Uh, in early childhood, we know of the intervention called banking time by just teachers spending 15 minutes twice a week with children who, have, who are experiencing behavioral and other challenges. They not only kind of strengthen that child's development, but the lowers the cortisol level of the children from morning to afternoons. And in middle schools, uh, in a series of intervention called empathy intervention, having empathetic relationships with just one teacher in the entire school helped to reduce suspensions by as much as 50% uh, in that context. So, it, the, and, and the point here isn't that we grab each of these interventions as some kind of a silver bullet. But, but, but with the principles that these interventions seem to highlight are the principles that you have described today about the integration of health and relationships and the practical things that we can do um, to encourage, to bring hope back um, into whatever practice that we do, whether it's pediatrics or teaching or any other arena serving children and families. Um, before we leave, I would just love to turn back to both of you. Are there any words of insight, advice that you felt not only guided your work, but that could continue to bring hope and encouragement to all of our listeners out there today? I think, you know, the only other thing that I found over the pandemic is that, um, and we knew this, but I've sort of started to do this more intentionally is to reach out and build connections in the community, step outside a little bit more out of my clinic because we cannot do anything alone with as, as physicians, right? So joining hands more with community organizations and others in the community. Uh, we're, we're all in this together. So those relationships as well. So I would encourage educators to reach out to, to medical providers in the community and, and, and others, um, and of course, community organizations as well. So that's something that's really sort of helped, I think, um, helped us sort of direct patients to resources and so on and so forth. So that's another big learning for me that's come out of the pandemic. I would say that lean in on relationships in the re recovery periods that we're in and realize that how critical those are for our future and, um, and the power that that brings in its both simplistic way, but its intentionality way. Relationships matter. Thank you so much, Dr. Ramachandran and Dr. Willis uh, for joining us today for this conversation and for bringing us this message of hope and encouragement. Uh, when it comes to relationships and children and families. And I thank all of you who have listened in today. 
please stay in touch and check out um, the Education Now series to watch this as well as other episodes. Take care and stay well, everyone. And as David said, relationship matters.